<laughs> um, achievement to where it's like I'm on this level mm -hmm. that other people can't understand. You know what I'm talking about? You ever met somebody who's like that that's super Christian and they're on this level and you know and they're they're not going the, the nuts and bolts, the the place where you live every day, they're never there. They're always on higher ground with everything. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, the, the Christian life, the Christian experience is lived in your shoes with your feet on the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. Every day. But if you get up in the morning and you say, I'm going to get something from God, just anything, right now, and you get it. <laughs> I mean, just get up in the morning and say, I'm going to get something from God, anything, right now. And uh, like Jacob wrestling with the angel, you say, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Now, there, that's not profound, to be quite frank with you. You know how easy it is to get something from God? Go to Him. Yes. Go to His Word. He's there saying, I want to give you something. Ask for it. And then start your day that way. And then just be real. You know, sometimes we Christians want to be such perfect Christians that when we fail, and we do, that we are so devastated that we just, we're silenced. We're just, well, you know what? You know, I told everybody what, it, you know, what I was going to do for God, and now look what I've done. And so now I'm not going to do anything because, you know, obviously I'm a failure, I'm a hypocrite. And you know, humility is what we need as a believer. To let people know all the time, Jesus is perfect, I'm not. But Jesus is working on me. God's working on me. And so, I want us to know, and we're going to get there today, I want us to know that soul winning is more real than you understand. And we're going to conclude today with a group-led discussion. Now, you know me. And you know my educational philosophy is not to let the students teach the class. Now, I'm not, you guys obviously would be advanced. You're, everybody here is educated. And so you would be advanced students. Everyone here, if we were to get together and collectively develop a curriculum on soul winning, everyone here would have something to contribute. And so we're going to do that in the end, but I, I want to just kind of open the discussion today. We're going to end it with discussion, so I want to go through some things. And uh, <clears throat> today's purpose is to equip you to reach your souls. To reach your souls. And I want to just remind you about something, because in order for you to effectively reach souls, the most important thing is for you to have a good relationship with God. To have a walk with God. You cannot isolate winning people to Christ and living for Christ. In other words, if it's not genuine in your life, and I'm not talking about whether or not you're saved, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're born again. But if you're not genuinely living for the Lord Jesus, you won't be an effective soul winner. You won't even want to be. Or if you do, it'll be a cover-up. I think sometimes soul winning is a cover-up for people. You know, preach the gospel to those lost people so they don't look at the way I'm living or so I can overlook things in my life. I can say, I'm great here, so who cares how I am here? And consistency in the Christian's life is what's going to make you an effective soul winner. If you don't have a good relationship with God, you won't be an effective soul winner. Okay? Here we go. This is John 13, 33 through 35. And this is a, this is a personal commandment for the church, for disciples, for believers. To be a great Christian, we could say you need to be a great disciple, couldn't we? And this is really a passage of Scripture that ought to impact every believer. This is right before Jesus goes to the cross, right after He's told Judas Iscariot that, uh, you know, that you know what you're going to do, you're going to betray me, so Judas goes out. And then Jesus gives a new commandment and then tells Peter right after this text that Peter's going to betray him. And that's when Peter said, Oh, everyone deny thee, I'll not deny thee. And then Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And then, you know, uh, Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, neither. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But it's interesting that sandwiched in the middle of this these uh, terrifically traumatic events. Who is that up there? Is that magic? I think so. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Is, is he allowed to be out there? <laughs> he just arrived. All right. Oh, okay. All right, cool. All right. 
So in the middle of these terrific, traumatic events, Jesus gives a new commandment to his disciples. He said, little children, yet a little while am I, I am with you. You shall seek me, as I said to the Jews. Whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, get this, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now let's analyze a couple of things briefly. How convincing was Jesus that he was the Son of God? How convincing was his lifestyle that he was the Son of God? Could we say any open-minded person would have been thoroughly convinced? Mm -hmm. Any person who's open-minded would have said, undeniably, you are the Son of God. Right? Now, obviously, individuals that refuse to believe can't be convinced of anything. But anyone who's open-minded couldn't deny that Jesus was the Son of God. Okay? So being a disciple of Lord Jesus, the statement... By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Do you see the connection here? I don't know if God's real. Well, if you wanted to know if Jesus were real, you could just look at what he did, right? I don't know if God's real. Well, if you see a disciple who accurately depicts or reflects the teaching of his master, then you can know God's real. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? In other words, we don't have to do miracles. I'm going to turn the AC up just a little bit because it just got cold in here. Um, we don't have to do miracles. We have the Word of God, which is an accurate reflection of the miracles. And that's a fact. In other words, any person that wants to see for themselves miracles could take the Word of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit be convinced of the miracles. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Okay, let me give you a couple of things that are undeniable evidences that God does supernatural things. By the way, this is why this is so much under attack right now. The existence of the nation of Israel is an evidence that there's a supernatural God. How is that? Well, because you can't deny Israeli history. A group of people that those scattered abroad today have one of the most ancient histories going back to slavery in Egypt and crossing through the Red Sea, a couple million people being sustained in the wilderness and walking into the Promised Land. That's their history. Now, a lot of people deny it. Oh, it never happened. But anyone who wants to go to those places and walk on the ground can see it happen. So the evidence is undeniable and the Word of God testifies of it. In other words, I don't have to do a miracle. The miracles are in the Word of God. But one of the things that will be a hindrance to someone believing is the level of my discipleship. Now, that's a lot of impetus, isn't it? That's placed on the soul winner. If you're a nasty neighbor, you won't win your neighbors. If you're a mean co-worker, you won't win your co-worker. If you're a selfish friend, you won't win your friends. Who you are will render you either effective or ineffective as a soul winner. And that all has to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if believers love one another, and if believers uh, love each other, the Bible says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Okay? Now, don't overlook the simple things. Pastor, I've been working on my presentation of the gospel so well. Well, you may have a speech, but your speech doesn't measure up to what you live. Okay, so... This is for the believer. This is our creed. I mean, we have a couple commandments in the New Testament of the Scripture. One of the commandments in the New Testament, of course, is uh, the last words of Jesus. What are the last words of Jesus? It's about discipleship as well, isn't it? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. What is the to observe all things? Whatsoever I've commanded you. What Jesus taught his disciples. In other words, disciples making disciples. Discipleship, friend, is not the means or method for salvation. In other words, we don't teach people how to live like a disciple 
and they become saved that way. A person gets saved by receiving Jesus. Then they grow by being a disciple. But your discipleship, your level of discipleship, the way that you grow and the way that you follow Jesus has everything to do with how effective you will be as a soul winner. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't muddy the waters too much there with it. Okay, the second thing. Sanctification or separation. Our, our series last summer that I preached made a real profound impact on me and just the clarity that I see the importance of as biblical separation. Separation is a swear word in Christianity today. But it's a swear word because of it's, it's negative, the way that it's defined, and it is not. It's one of the most positive things it could possibly be. And so biblical separation, this is Isaiah when he saw God. He saw the throne room of God in heaven high and lifted up. And he had that dramatic scene in the throne room of heaven where the, the seraphims are crying, holy, 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 there's smoke filling the temple, and, and when they cried, the, the pillars shook. This terrifying scene, the holiness of God is a terrifying reality. God is so holy that if you were to see His presence, you couldn't do it and live. So Isaiah, Isaiah sees the throne, he sees God high and lifted up, and he falls on his face, and he said, woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verses 6 and 7 are incredible. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Okay, in our first week, what do we say are the, are the qualifications for a soul winner? You have to be saved, right? You have to be saved. And a person who is saved is therefore called. called. Okay, or he's, yeah, he's also a disciple, but he's called to be a soul winner. All right, so we looked at that. So to know whether or not I'm a soul winner, whether or not this is God's purpose and plan in my life, and whether or not God could actually use me in this way, I have to be saved. Check. Mm -hmm. Saved people are called. Check. That's me. Okay, <coughs> look at this, verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. How did Isaiah make himself worthy of God? He didn't. He didn't, did he? God purged him. God cleansed him. Do you ever feel unworthy of the gospel? Yeah. Who doesn't? I'm not, this message is a message about a perfect, sinless, holy God. About salvation. Again, this is, this is God's message. And I'm an unclean man. How can an unclean man give it? Well, God, God qualifies you, that's how. Isn't that great? And then, um, the next statement was, <clears throat> Who shall I send and who will, uh, who will go for us and whom shall I send? And what is Isaiah's statement? Here am I, send me. Oh, here am I. Send me. In other words, your willingness to be a soul winner isn't because you've cleaned up your act and you're qualified. Your willingness to be a soul winner is because God's cleansed you. God has purged you. And you say, well, Pastor, today I'm not really clean. To be quite honest with you, there are unconfessed sins in my life. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And then you cleanse yourself from all unrighteousness. No, and He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You're always qualified to preach the gospel because of what Jesus has done and not because of what you've done. That'll help you. Get that truth and realize this message is not qualified by me. This message is qualified by God. Okay? And then be real about it. You saw me lose my temper and it wasn't right. I want to come over here. I just want to. Uh, I just want to talk to you right now about that thing that happened yesterday when you parked on my grass. You know who cares about stupid grass? You can park on my grass all you want to. I care more about you than grass. You know God convicted me about what I said to you. <coughs> I almost this this comes up because I don't like people parking on my grass, and people do all the time, all the time. I've got tire tracks in my front yard right now. It's irritating. Oh, um, it's that time of the year when you need to grow grass, not kill it. And um, it just gets me. 
And you know something? I've been going out and moving my car out of the way so the people across the street can park on my grass. Because why? I want to be a good neighbor. You know, why do you have to put your garbage cans in front of my house? Why do your garbage cans have, and, and why, you know, not just garbage cans, overflowing dumpster, you know, overflowing with the paper blowing out of the untied bags onto my lawn. Every time I come out, I have to pick up your nasty garbage and put it back in the dumpster. And you leave the dumpsters in front of my house, so I have to roll them over to your house. So what? You know, you know, you better never say a word. Better never say a crossword to your neighbors. Just, just be a good neighbor. Just be that guy that, you know, shovel. You know, why does a neighbor? You know, it's you know, it's illegal not to shovel your sidewalk. You people that come from snow and all I'm talking about. Somebody's going to slip, and they're going to fall, and you're going to be liable for it. So I got to come over here and shovel your sidewalk because you're not going to do it. Hey, just shovel your neighbor's drive. Get yourself a really good snowblower and be that guy that just does everybody's yard. You know, you know, if my neighbor cut his grass, the weeds wouldn't grow like that and take over my lawn. Just start cutting your neighbor's grass. You know, as, as, as a believer, we're going to talk about this, but as a believer, your testimony is the biggest, most important thing, <clears throat> the greatest thing. I don't appreciate when I do things for him. I want to be a soul winner. I don't need to be appreciated. Right? In other words, I, I want to I fulfill my life's purpose. You fulfill your life's purpose. It's the only thing that will give you contentment, satisfaction, and joy. Mm -hmm. And that, isn't that what we want? Yeah. Anybody here want to have all those things? Anybody want to just be happy about life? Just enjoy it? Okay. All right. <laughs> if you went to Pensacola Christian College, you know this. I don't think, I'm not sure if these are just Pensacola's effective speech speaker principles, but when you go to college, you're required to take speech. One of the things we had to do when we were in college is learn the effective speaker principles. And uh, I just want to just uh, go over these because they translate. Uh, a soul winner is a communicator, right? We communicate the gospel. And so, <coughs> I want to go through these. Um, the effective speaker is a person whose character, knowledge, and judgment command respect. I thought about having Elizabeth Warren in this morning. <laughs> to instruct us. Oh Y'all would come just to see her and see if she... <laughs> All right. Does Elizabeth Warren with thinking people have much credibility? Zero. Yes. Huh? She does have credibility with thinking well. people? I said thinking people. That's the qualification. <laughs> thinking <laughs> people. Okay. You know, a person that's, she what, one thousand, one thousandth Indian? And she, to me, she didn't have good character. A person who will lie and say that they're American Indian. Mm -hmm. That's what she got really crucified last year for. Oh, she, uh, she has one zero one. university background. Well, she has degrees. Yeah, that, yeah. She has she education, but, I, but, but character. Uh, the effective but, but speaker is a person it. whose character, knowledge, and judgment command respect. Mm -hmm. Well, she'd have a hard time. She'd have a hard time with this crowd. Just put it that way. She'd have a hard time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely adore uh, this Ocasio Cortez girl. <laughs> oh, don't. Are you sarcastic? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I do just love watching her speak. I'll be honest with you. The, this, the, the poor girl is like... her voice quality? Everything about her. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to fix the world. <laughs> she has no clue. knowledge, no clue about anything, <laughs> right? Okay, the effective speaker is a person whose character, knowledge, and judgment command respect. Can we say the effective soul winner is a person whose character, knowledge, and judgment command respect? Hey, yes. you know, if you're going to be effective yeah. in preaching the gospel, your walk, at the very least, needs to be effective. You know, Proverbs has a lot to say about just wisdom. Uh, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. James talks about the tongue, the unbridled, unfettered tongue and the danger of it. Uh, an, effective, <coughs> an effective soul winner is going to be a person who is concerned with his character, his knowledge, 
in his judgment. A person who flies off half-cocked at every little thing. A person who has a loose, uncontrolled temperament. A person who uh, says what they think before they think all the time. A person who makes bad decisions over and over and over again. Can I say to you, won't be an effective soul winner? So why does she think she's effective? Okay. I mean, you well, know, she's, she's the poster to child. No, she's she's the poster child for the, you know, she really believes, she really believes, the the, the socialist nonsense. I know. I she know. really believes it. She really believes that money grows on trees. I mean, she just thinks that, you know, these trillions of dollars. You know, again, I don't want to get go yeah, too off into her policy. My only point, I'm just bringing up people yeah. that if I would go to hear her if she were in town, just because she cracks me up. I mean, the mm -hmm. stuff she says is so far from outer space that just brings joy to my heart. I'll just be honest with you. She's hilarious. I, I don't know of anyone who, without trying to be, is funnier than her. She's really funny. But she, but she's really terribly yeah. ignorant. Well, and then you it know. says, love your neighbor as yourself. So there is <clears throat> where the love and the prayer comes in for her as a person who's a leader. Sure, I don't even have any angst toward her. She's, you know? you know, I just hope that people are intelligent enough to realize, like, she didn't have a brain. But she's just I'm not missing sure her brain. Well, there, there are certain. <laughs> she's the poster child. The media do. want her. The, yeah. here, here's a sad. Here's a tragic thing about it. The media are going to destroy her in the next year or two. They put her in, but she's going to she's going to blunder or something, and she's going to go from poster child. The, the the liberal media does this to people. They bring you up and then they destroy you, and they will destroy her. She's she's uh, she's not going to make it. Uh, any candidate would love to run against her. And so, you know, they'd be thrilled if she'd be, you know, a na national candidate. But anyway, she uh, can't. all that. She's six years too young. Well, right now. <laughs> she's getting getting older every year, though. Yeah, we <laughs> so, six years to go. Yeah. But uh, the, her party will be the ones that destroy her. Anyway, but yeah. I, I actually feel, feel badly for, for her. But uh, I don't want to say dumb because it's not a nice word. Boy, the girl's not very... She's not, she doesn't really know anything that, that it has to do with common sense. We're off on the same list. You need to read a book. Okay. The effective speaker has a message to deliver, has a definite purpose in getting that message, and is consumed with the necessity of getting that message across and accomplishing that purpose. You ever want to tell somebody something? You want to tell somebody something? Um, when you really want to tell somebody something, it's going to come up. Isn't it? And an effective speaker obviously needs to come up at the right time. Now, if you're intelligent as a young person, an intelligent child knows how and where to ask. A pastor friend posted on Facebook yesterday a very, very good request for a bearded dragon by his daughter. I'm sorry? A pastor friend posted yesterday on Facebook a really, really well-phrased request for a bearded dragon by his daughter. Does your daughter ever ask for pets? Yes. Yes, okay. So... Mm -hmm. Is timing important when you're asking for something? For sure, of course. Is presentation important? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, you don't come home from school and be like, yeah, here's my report card. I failed everything. Can I have a pet? <laughs> <laughs> In other words, it's not an effective. In, in that kid, there may be kids that don't quite have the effective speaker principles down. Mine. And they don't really know when and where and how to ask for things. Yes. But there's a way, you know... There's a way. Hey, Mom and Dad, you want to come check my room? I cleaned it. I want to see if it's up to your standard. <laughs> All right, what you want? Have, have your kids ever done this? You know, I just decided to clean my room and organize everything, and I just want you to come in and let me know if it's up to your standard. And they come in and inspect. Everything's perfect. All right, what do you want to tell me? How much? I wrecked the car. You know? <laughs> in other words, okay. Now, my point in this is... There's a there's a there's a time a place and a way to present the gospel, isn't there? You know this is where door to door soul winning, which is an effective method for meeting people, reaching people, and even sometimes leading the Lord right then and there. But it's where it falls down <laughs> because people are there just to process somebody at a door. Mm -hmm. That's not really what an effective speaker does, mm -hmm. uh, because you. You have a message to deliver. You have a purpose of getting... Now listen. <clears throat> There's an urgency to the gospel. 
Anytime somebody just refuses to hear or listen to me, I try to get them a gospel tract. I try to get something. You know, when I, when I go door to door, uh, the first thing that I do... I want to grab a tract. <clears throat> or even if I'm walking on the street, if I knock on somebody's door, cold turkey, don't know them, uh, first thing I do is I stand back pretty well because I don't want to... Because I'm ugly. And I don't want to frighten anybody. You know, I don't want to be an imposing figure. Especially like if it's a lady or whatever. But before I say a word. Hey, how are you doing? Notice, I get gospel literature in their hand and I get far enough away they can't give it back. <laughs> before I say anything. Sometimes people say no thank you and I'll just be like. When you take it out of my hand, then I can speak, you know. But I can't, you know. Anyway, but there's an urgency. I, I always want to leave the message. I always want to get the gospel in, mm -hmm. if I can. But if I'm going to be effective in giving the gospel, the time, the presentation, the <clears throat> method, the way that I deliver it is really important, isn't it? Uh, the effective speaker realizes that the primary purpose of speech, and this is for a speech class, so this doesn't fit everything here perfectly, is the communication of ideas and feelings in order to get a desired response. Now let me ask you a question. Does that fit with soul winning? Yeah. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Do you think then <clears throat> we might need to work on how we present the gospel as a person in order to get a desired response? I would think so. I would think so too. Okay. The effective speaker analyzes and adjusts to every speaking situation. Everybody's different. And the way, the more you can relate to people and their differences, mm -hmm. the more you can get into a conversation or the place where you can talk to them. Mm -hmm. For sure. you know, if you're one of these people like, well, you know, I'm really not interested in that. Get interested in that because there's somebody that is. I don't really care for sports. Well, I'll be honest with you, sports are kind of like a major, massive waste of resources and time in most instances. 85% of people are... Uh, majorly into sports. 85% of people are majorly into sports. So just go ahead and tell them, you know, the thing that's really important to you is stupid. <laughs> now let me tell you the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the effective speaker analyzes and adjusts to every speaking situation. I have some personal opinions if you want to probe me. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm at least educated to the antagonistic circle <coughs> on sports teams. I can at least antagonize you, which is a part of the whole thing, you know. So, mm -hmm. it's not because sports are majorly important in my world. It's because they're really important in other people's world. The effective speaker chooses topics which are significant and appropriate. Okay, we're going to spend time together. We have to spend time together, whatever. Anytime I spend time with somebody whether it's at work, whether it's for a hobby or interest, whether it's because of a neighbor or any time. Anytime God brings somebody across my path, I'm going to try to share the gospel with them. I'm going to try to share the gospel with anyone who crosses my path. Not all, I've met people that are just so, I'm going to be a soul winner, that man, they just come across as like just weird, awkward, and ineffective. And it's, I'm just like, you know, you... I wish you could just see what people think. They just think you're just just crazy. Like you just they're not even in touch with reality. You don't even you don't even connect with a person, and you're trying to like give them this message, you know. But I'm gonna tell you something. Everybody I connect with, I want to I want to preach the gospel too. So we're gonna have conversation. There are gonna be things in the conversation which are just going to be for the purpose of ultimately the thing coming up. Brother John, I used a phrase with you the other day, and that was that it seems like people try to drag the gospel out of you. Or, you know, it's like people like probe me for the gospel, it seems like. Mm -hmm. It just comes up in conversation. We're talking about things. Just people get into meaningful conversations with me a lot. Not knowing even that I'm a pastor. I'm just talking about it as a person. I can be going through a checkout, and just by uh, reading somebody's name tag, using their name and asking them, how are you? 
And it's just amazing how we get into meaningful conversation. They tell me, well, this weekend I'm going on a trip to here. Or here. I got, man, I'll tell you, I'm not good. Uh, you know, my dad answer. But it's just people get into serious conversation with me and it leads to the gospel. People all the time are like, so what do you do with me? I mean, well, you know, I'm a pastor. Oh. And I mean, they just start like, you know, give me the gospel then. Let's have it, man. I mean, honestly, it's not that awkward to get into this situation where you can share the gospel with somebody. It's not, an, you know, we'll, we start into this automatic, robotic sounding. Okay, I want to get to our point here. We only have a few minutes before I want to get really in. Okay, so <clears throat> the effective speaker reads and listens with discrimination, neither blindly accepting the ideas of others nor stubbornly refusing to consider opinions opposed to his own. <clears throat> there are a lot of things that will be um, hindrances to the gospel, and a lot of times the hindrances to the gospel are believers. And, or so-called pseudo-believers. Well, in other words, what some people say or do is a hindrance to the gospel. Jesse Duplantis doesn't help the gospel. Joel Osteen doesn't help the gospel. Uh, in other words, these individuals are, you know, fundamental Baptists who go by the words or phrases fundamental Baptists that stand on street corners and, and uh, scream vitriol at people. Hmm. Yeah. Don't help the gospel. At all. None of those things help the gospel. Mm -mm. And so, when somebody has something to say, listen, and if you can, agree. Remember speaking with an atheist, an angry atheist, some years ago. So I mean, he's so angry that he, he, the words could not come out of his mouth. He was just so agitated. I remember a couple times just by going through and putting a door hanger on his door, he'd call me. Uh, in his neighborhood, and his name was Drew. Looked at, I, I reverse looked up his phone number, found his address, and looked and saw, you know, looked, found out some things about him. You know, two men are on a title of a deed of a house, and you know, obviously, he was in a relationship with a man, and that sort of thing. And, and a lot of things, well, a lot of things that you can assume, but he would call, and he's so angry. And I would just say, Drew, I don't, I, I want to understand why you're so angry. Because I said, you know, we're not. We just wanted, all we did was invited you to come to our church. Nobody condemned you, nobody said anything. We just, we just wanted to just give you an open invitation, let you know you're welcome to come to our church. I don't know why that makes you so angry. He would be, he, the things he would say. Well, I listened to him, and after a while I realized, okay, somebody in the name of Christ has done something really evil. Mm -hmm. Probably he's in his lifestyle because of, because of probably, I, I, my guess is sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's probably what it was. As a matter of fact, guys, you would not believe how many times when you're sharing the gospel that sexual abuse is a hindrance to it. Mm -hmm. I, it's just amazing to me how prolific it is. Mm -hmm. It's unreal that people use power and the name of God to commit mm -hmm. the most abominable, abominable atrocities mm -hmm. on, on children and, and young people. It, it's just incredible. Shoot. Teens and adults too. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what they, that person did to you is the most evil thing in the world and God absolutely hates it. Amen. And if you think for a minute that God's forgotten about it and that He's not going to take care of that person, the only reason they're not already burning in hell is because God's a very merciful God. Because everybody does deserve hell. And I want to tell you something. God hates what they did and so do I. I hate it too. You know, just agreeing with somebody. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. I, I went with a, a brother one time, and he just didn't hear what a man was saying. He's from the church. And he said, you know what, I'm not against God, but I, the, the whole church thing. And the guy started defending church. He wasn't talking about church. He was talking about Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And he'd been abused by a priest, the man we were speaking to. And I told the guy, I said, you know, you know, uh, you know what he was trying to tell you? You know why he's so angry? Uh, because of what happened to him. Acknowledge it. That's wicked. God hates it. That's not God doing that. I agree with you. That's the most despicable, abominable thing. I hate it too. Mm -hmm. I'm mad with you. A lot of times we ostracize people because we don't listen. And the effective speaker uh, reads and listens with discrimination. Mm -hmm. He's not attacking Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Nobody ever did anything to him here. 
He's attacking what he knows to be church. Mm -hmm. Listen to it, separate that, discriminate. See, reason, listen with discrimination. That's a really good point. We have to listen. If you're going to be a good soul winner, you're going to have to listen and figure out what people are telling you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not good communicators, and a good communicator can communicate for the person who's talking to him. That happened to me and when I was talking to the guy in the hot tub. He's, he's, he brought up these Baptist uh, pastors that had abused children. He said that was, a, that was an obstacle to him. Mm. You have to acknowledge it. You have to say, you know, if that happened in our church, our pastor would be in jail. Mm -hmm. right. We have policy in place. And uh, we'd expose him. He wouldn't be covered up. That's the way it should be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it just comes back to, what do you think God thinks about that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Somebody acting in His name and using using His name for power. Do you think that's, do you think that's what Jesus was teaching for discipleship? Mm -hmm. Oh, God hates that. Mm -hmm. God hates that. I do too. I hate that. You know, and you know it's not because I'm you know better than anybody else, but I'm just telling you something. God didn't do that. And somebody, you know what's behind. You don't have to be able to read somebody's mind or heart to know what's behind somebody using religion to abuse someone. That's wicked. Just acknowledge it with them. And you know what? It's amazing how that gets put in the mm -hmm. past. The effective speaker chooses topics which are significant and appropriate. Don't talk about stupid stuff with people and expect to get into serious conversation. I mean, it's fine to open with a joke or whatever, but you know, when people get heavy in conversation, it gets spiritual pretty soon. It gets philosophical, doesn't it? Pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and have deep conversation with people. And you got a coworker that you know is dealing with something. Go ahead and let to go ahead and talk at work. If you're allowed to talk at work about stuff, go ahead and talk at work about stuff. So you know, I wish, I wish your boyfriend would come to church. Mm -hmm. In our church, I bet you, I bet you, I bet you, if if he came to our church, I bet that I bet we could help him. You know, you both should come. You know, because here's here's a scenario where that happened one time, and here's what the Bible said, and this person believed the Bible, and here's what God did in their life. You can give somebody hope, even before they get saved, mm -hmm. that God can change. God, you know, God, God. You ever seen somebody? Some people, people never change. I hate that statement. People never change. You know, people change for good, and people change for bad. Mm -hmm. People change. And you know, I know a guy that used to do that, and I would tell you something, I don't think he'll ever do it again. He's a different person. God changed him. Mm -hmm. Topics which are significant and appropriate. Things that lead to the gospel. Philosophical. Okay. What did I do? I go backward here? Oh, yes, I did. All right. Reads, listens, discrimination. And a great soul winner is a great disciple. This is, of course, the, the most famous Jeopardy ever where this guy, I believe he actually ended up winning, but he didn't know the answer, and so it was... Um, 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 what is it? Well, this is his answer. You know how you write, and then it shows up on your screen? Yeah. And he didn't know the name of the person, so he put, who is this handsome gentleman? So, <laughs> uh, or himself. I love it. And so, anyway, you want to know what a great soul winner looks like? Go get in a mirror and just love on yourself. Just look at yourself and say, oh, you great soul winner, you. Uh, honestly, the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is you, you, you look like a great soul winner to me. You do. Now I want to talk about some great soul winners. Who are the greatest soul winners? And we're going to talk about some. I'm going to steal some thunder. This is our discussion part. And I hope this is where we get our minds open just a little bit this morning. Uh, of course, we know that in order to be a great soul winner, you need to be a, an, an effective soul winner. And I, I took out effective speaker and I just put soul winner in here. An effective soul winner is right with God and right with others. Dude, what did Jesus say about an individual that brings a gift? Charlie, what did he say? You have odd against your brother. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, leave the gift with the elder. Go get it right. Yeah, go get right with your brother. Okay, so an effective soul winner is right with God, right with others. There's no mystery if you harbor a grudge or if you've mistreated your brother. And you know, a lot of times we just overlook our, our sin. Sometimes we need to have that God search me, know my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, lead me into the way of life everlasting, conversation with God. Say, God, you know, sometimes I'm oblivious about the way I actually am and I need you. You know, I've been just randomly driving in my vehicle and talking to God and God has just said, you know, you're a real jerk 20 years ago to them, whatever. <laughs> when you say it to your brother... Also, you just mean in people in general? Or yeah, the Christian brother specifically. specifically but you know, we're, we're supposed to love our neighbor <coughs> and we're supposed to love our brother. enemy. Okay. We're supposed to love our enemies. If you haven't loved your enemy, mm -hmm. you've got it all against 
in, in the same context. Right. You mentioned Sarah, Sarah Huckabee in the beginning, and uh, Sanders rather, and she's a perfect example of an ambassador. She's someone who mm -hmm. represents the person that she's representing, which is the president in this case, mm -hmm. and that's what every an ambassador should do. Yeah. But we're to represent God mm -hmm. as his ambassador. Yeah, look up ambassador in the Bible and study the context of now that we are ambassadors mm -hmm. for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. In other words, God is using me to plead with you. We uh, beg you in Christ's stead. Mm -hmm. or we, we to plead in Christ's stead. So we stand in Christ's stead. We are standing in the place of God, pleading with people. That's, we're ambassadors, we're representatives for Jesus Christ. So in effect, your soul winner has to be right with God and right with others. Mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't ever at odds with anybody that, that he, he reached, was he? <coughs> and a disciple, if we're going to be known as a disciple, we can't be the same. What's the mark of somebody that, that uh, is a disciple of Jesus? That we love one another. If you're unloving, friend, you, 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 how in the world can you be effective as a soul winner? Again, this is not rocket surgery. Mm. This isn't brain science. Mm. This is common sense. But yet, individuals will overlook, you know, they'll be soul winners on door to door, but they're not soul winners at home. Mm -hmm. They'll be soul winners, you know, when they're out in public, but they're not soul winners at work. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing mm -hmm. to me sometimes to meet co workers of some Christians. Mm -hmm. embarrasses me sometimes. Mm -hmm. A Christian ought to be the most well-liked person on his job. Mm -hmm. You just shut. You may, you may irritate people with your um, promptness, your example. You know, you may make people feel like, well, you know, he works harder than everybody and, you know, it kind of raises the standard. I wish he wouldn't do that. But they'll admire you for that, ultimately. But, you know, you ought to be the most admired person at your work. <clears throat> Should. And, and at home as a neighbor. You gotta be the nicest guy in your block, the best neighbor, and I, you know, it just ought to be. So, all right, who are great soul winners? Well, there's people who are right with God, right with others. And an effective soul winner knows who he is and what his purpose is. Why am I working this job? Why am I here? I'm here because this is the place God has put me so I can reach these people. Know who you are and what your purpose is. I'm a mechanic, I'm a farmer. I'm a, you know, an engineer, I'm a computer guy, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, but what I am is a soul winner. That's what I am. God put me here to reach the people here. That's why I'm here. Now, who are they? Well, yeah, you're already saved, okay, but let's team up. You know, we're on the same team, and we're trying to get people to join the team. My boss was a Christian when I was in college. I worked in a, in a mechanic shop. Lee's, Lee's grandpa worked there as well, and, um, uh, great environment but he used to he used to we had stalls you know with the lift and your tools and everything and he used to put Christian lost person Christian mm. lost person <laughs> he staggered him so every lost person was on had a believer on either side mm -hmm. so you're on this side of your car working and this guy's over here and you're chatting what are you talking about <laughs> you're on this side you're over here and you're chatting with this guy what are you talking about mm -hmm. and uh, the boss is a Christian you know, the guys up front are Christians. And I mean, it was just stacked. Mm -hmm. It was just stacked, you know. Mm -hmm. And they'd be looking for a hire. Mm -hmm. Well, we lost a guy. Let's see if we can get a guy that's lost to come in and take his place. Mm -hmm. Best soul winning environment ever. Mm -hmm. All day long. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, but it being effective is important. Okay. Now, here's the question. Uh-oh. All right, we're back again. Let's... Back to, where are we at? All right, uh, an effective soul owner knows who he is and what his great purpose is. Now, here's why I want to ask you a question. Uh, name some great soul winners. Okay, I'll start off. I mentioned a little bit ago uh, Lee's grandpa. Lee's grandpa was one of the greatest soul winners I ever knew. Probably, I mean, only heaven knows. How many thousands of people are saved because of Lee's granddad? Mm -hmm. You know what Lee's granddad did most of his life? He was a service manager at Sears. Mm -hmm. And then he was a service manager at Bankston's Auto Repair later on. He did other things, but for most of his life he was a service manager. All his kids are pretty much in 
ministry and his grandkids mm -hmm. as well. And that's but but Grandpa Maynard, everybody called him. But he ran. He was a captain of the Juanas in his church. And man, when he saw a kid, he saw a soul. He just, I mean, every kid in our town, about fifty thousand people knew. I, I'm not kidding you. I don't think there's any kid in town that didn't know Grandpa Maynard and hadn't been to Juanas at some time or other. He brought every everybody to Juanas. They had probably had a couple <clears throat> hundred kids in Juanas all the time, didn't they, Lee? Just about all the time. Just mm -hmm. hundreds of kids in Awanas. And his grandpa ran that. And he just he just got kids and brought them to Awanas. Everybody in the shop I worked in, even if they were lost, had gone to Awanas when they were a kid, if they lived in Salina. Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys are in 40s and 50s. And, oh yeah, I went to Awanas when I was in second grade or third grade or whatever. And that's where they got saved at. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be a kid's worker, pick up kids and bring them to church and they'll hear the gospel and get saved. And that makes you a soul winner. Problem. He's he's in the of guys I know. He's in one of the top uh, top mm -hmm. list of most effective soul winners. And when I ask you to tell me one of the most effective soul winners, you're thinking somebody's written a book, right, about soul winning, mm -hmm. or somebody that's yeah. a great preacher has preached crusades, or you know, you're trying to think of somebody well known and famous. Yeah. You know, most people in the world don't know Maynard Riffle. Didn't know mm -hmm. him. He's with the Lord now, but it, but uh, God knows about it. Mm -hmm. And he's a service manager at Sears. And I want to tell you, when he talks about being an effective speaker, mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't a perfect guy by any means, but it's pretty about, much about the nearest to it that anybody ever met could come. <coughs> always happy, always upbeat, joyful, kind. And you'd have a customer come in, red in the face, cursing and complaining, mm -hmm. and he'd walk up to them like, like they had come in with a smile offering him a donut from Jupiter. You know, whatever. I mean, he'd be like, well, we're going to get you taken care of right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to fix that. I mean, just, he did, you could come in with whatever attitude you wanted, and by the time you left, you were in a good mood. Mm -hmm. yeah, or at least you're like, well, you know what? If I'm going to be angry, it's not going to be at this guy. It's not going to, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, he was just that guy. And he had a great personality. He was perfect. He was a perfect face for any business mm -hmm. because of that. But you know what? He was a, he, you know what he's passionate about? You talk to him for any amount of time. He was passionate about Awana. Mm -hmm. Because it was about teaching kids the scripture and winning souls. He just cared about so he cared about ministry, he cared about souls. All he cared about. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me let me list another one. This is someone that if my mind is a little less perfect, one of the greatest soul winners I know is my dad. My dad. Uh, my dad, I don't know what you'd call him. If, you, if you've met my dad, he's just about the goofiest person you ever met. I mean, he's, he, I know he was class clown growing up, and he's still class clown. You know, he still embarrasses me today. He's still embarrassing me. He's just that guy. You know, everybody, as, as I was thinking about this this last week, who do I know that's a great soul winner? You know everybody my dad's ever come into contact with, I think, has heard the gospel. Every, I remember when my dad, had, we needed a church in our town, he'd start a little church, not because he wanted to be a pastor, but, but I just remember, you know, everybody that worked for my dad being getting saved and trying to help them with their problems and leading them all to the Lord and leading their kids to the Lord. And, and uh, even today, you know, I mean, if you know the kind of people that come to junkyards and work in <laughs> junkyards, you, you pro most of you probably don't, honestly. But those are the kind of people my dad wins. He also wins some kind of high society kind of people. I don't know why they want to hang around with him, but there's just something about my dad that people are like, oh, let's go hang out with John Price. You know, it's going to be some entertainment. But, um, you know, he just wins people. He's not perfect, and everybody knows him knows it. But he's never been hung up about the matter of sharing the gospel with people. And, you know, uh, people we prayed for for years, in the last few years, have recently gotten saved. And some of the people that go to his church are just guys that work for him and that he led to the Lord. And some of his close friends now, they're just all people that he led to the Lord, people he rubbed shoulders with. And he just reached the people around him and want them. Uh, nobody's ever going to be like, well, John Price is a great soul winner. But he actually is. 
probably out of all the people I know, one of the most real, down-to-earth, effective soul winners. Effective at preaching the gospel. Uh, you name some. Tell me. How do you know that's a I good soul winner? Jack, uh, Jack Hiles. And I know he, was always he taught a lot of soul winning, yeah. But he, you know, just, we talked to him, and he's just... He can mm -hmm. engage you at any level. He could. You know, Jack Hiles used to, in uh, service on Sunday nights sometimes, you know, you're talking about, you know, several thousand people in a, in a crowd, not the thousands that they advertised. Those people were all on buses somewhere in back rooms. But in several thousand people in a crowd. Jack Hiles on Sunday nights would say, does anybody have a question about anything you need some personal advice about? You could say, well, I'm thinking about buying a TV, and I'm wondering what the best specs would be and what brands you'd recommend and where to buy it at. <laughs> And he'd tell you. He'd know where. He'd be like, well, you know, here's, I mean, he just knew stuff about just about everything. Mm -hmm. And an effective soul winner is a, is a person who can talk to anybody about anything. Mm -hmm. Really. Honestly, when we go door to door, I usually don't make it more. If there are, say there are five people home uh, on the block I'm going to go to, <clears throat> I don't usually make it five people. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm a great soul winner, but I, I can con converse with everybody about anything. You know, you know, I've always tried, and it's my dad is this way. I'm kind of like my dad in some ways. But my dad is interested in everything. He talk to anybody about anything. Remember, he came down to go soul winning with me a few years ago. And we were over in Lauderdale by the sea in kind of a hoity-toity neighborhood. And we knocked on a door. And this guy came, and he had a patch on, and... Um, and I think it I think it was throat cancer, something like that. Anyway, he said, guys, I am not up to being bothered today. I, I'm going through good. And my dad took his shirt and pulled it down. And he goes, yeah, I had breast cancer just about, you know, whatever, <laughs> years ago. <laughs> you know, uh, shows him his scar. Uh, and we got to share the gospel with the guy. Uh, I mean, just, some pe just some people, you know, are just... <laughs> can just talk to people, you know, just relate to them. I mean, here's a guy, he I mean, obviously a guy that's going through treatments doesn't feel like talking to anybody. But somebody that says, you know what, you might, you're going to be all right, bud. You, you know, it's here, I've done this. You know, well, just, I'm a social idiot, but, you know, it's really, <coughs> some, sometimes <laughs> I've learned to just try to be, if you just ask people about themselves. Uh -huh. and like that's everybody's favorite them, subject. And, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's usually the key yeah. when talking to people. Well, that's when I teach, <clears throat> when I teach going out and soul winning, that's one of the things I try to teach is, you know, how to talk about everybody's favorite subject. You know, a lot of times people are like, yeah, I'm really into, and you're like, that's dumb, man. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, if, if I don't know anything about something, I'm like, you know, I know nothing about that. Now, what is that? How in the world did you hear about that? How'd you get into that? <clears throat> and that's fun, huh? <laughs> I mean, whatever. You know, somebody wants, everybody wants to talk about their hobbies, their interests, their projects. You can walk up to somebody's house and tell everything about the person. If they got dirt for a lawn, you can tell, well, they don't care about their lawn. If they've got, you know, I'll tell you, somebody's got beautifully landscaped place, their house, or they've got a nice car. I mean, learn to identify what cars are underneath the tarp. You see a car under a cover, you know, that person, a yeah, car guy's going to talk to you about cars. I remember when I was in college, I, my friend, we were, we were bikers when I was in college, and um, everywhere we, we went, we rode bikes, motorcycles, I guess, you got to qualify for people who aren't bikers. But I remember my friend, this guy, we were in a nice neighborhood, and there was a Yamaha VMAX, and he wanted a VMAX, my friend did. It's kind of like a crossover street bike with way too much power. And uh, he just walks in this guy's garage. This guy's in his garage, you know. And I'm like, you, can't my, you walk in my garage. Well, you can't walk in my garage. But anyway, <laughs> and my friend just walks in like, man. And he just starts talking about the guy's motorcycle. And, you know, I realized then when I was in college, you know, you can talk to any biker about his bike. Any biker, I mean, it could be a ranged out piece of junk, and you can talk to him about it. He'll talk to you about his bike. You can talk to any car guy about his car. Mm -hmm. uh, you can talk. The guy's wearing, you know, tattoos are wonderful. What is that tattoo? And you just get over, you know, tattoos and mark of slavery, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I'm sure it is. But um, just talk to tattoo guys. What's, what's that on your arm? Well, you got any other tattoos? Well, don't show me some of those. 
<laughs> you know, what, what does that mean? You know, was some, most people's tattoos, when they mark on themselves, they mark something that they thought was significant. And you can be like, well, that's really a stupid reason to write on yourself. But that's not the point, is it? You know, tattoos are wonderful. I mean, a little mark, like a little tiny, what is that? What is that? Quick quag. Yeah. Tattoos all over his body. Yeah, well, they have that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, just, just ask people questions. Get over the whole, I'm a Christian and you look like a heathen. Thing. Well, of course they're a heathen. So am I before I was saved. Without Jesus, that's what I am. Uh, so just just talk to people. You know, that's got to be the biggest gold chain I've ever seen on anybody. Is that real? How do you keep somebody from hitting you on the head and taking that thing? You know, you ever been hit on the head? Better ask that at the right time, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, somebody like me is pretty disarming, generally yeah. speaking. <laughs> you know, you know, usually just ask it of a guy that's like three times bigger than you, and yeah. you know, whatever. Just ask the right guy. He's not gonna be. He's not gonna be like, oh, you're gonna hit me on the head. Like, look about behind you. <laughs> you know? Okay, but <laughs> see what I'm saying? Uh, at work, conversations. How many of your coworkers are going through life events? All of them. 100 percent of them are, right? Do you know what they are? I just go to work, I keep my head down and mind my own business. Well, knock that off. Don't, don't mind you. Don't get in people's business and meddle and be a busybody and gossip, but be the guy at work people talk to. One last thing. Have you noticed that when we talk about great soul winners, the connection's always the church? In other words, you're not going to be a great soul winner in isolation with God's plan for the whole commission. What's the great commission? Go, teach, or go baptize, teach. You can't do that without the church. The church is, is God's plan to do that. Maynard Riffle is a great soul winner. And you know, I'm sure one-on-one -on -one he led people to the Lord, but you know where most people got saved? at his church. He just brought them there. Ran a program. Spoke to them, you know, preached there, taught there. Had people preach and teach there. But he's the one everybody knows won them. But he won them where? Church. Uh, my dad, everybody wins, <coughs> he gets them in church. Brings them to church. That's where, that's where the plan is. That's where it gets done at. Sometimes we're wrong in bashing program-centered churches. What churches have the best attendance? Churches that have a lot of things going on for people or churches that don't have anything but the preaching services? Which churches get the best attendance? Program-centered churches. Do you know there's nothing wrong with a program as long as it's a soul-winning program? Mm -hmm. It's a soul winning program. No, a lot of churches that that's our beef. People go there, but they don't know. You know, like yeah, I went there because they had a really awesome restaurant. <laughs> you know, they had a class on golf. You know, they had whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, people are going there, and it's a community center, and they're connecting. I was talking to my neighbor Julio, who's not saved, and we're praying for. I was talking to him on Wednesday, and again he brought up. He said, "There's no community center in Oakland Park for senior citizens." So I've never been somewhere where there's no... He's like, South Florida doesn't have... Like, has all the seniors and no senior citizens or community center. You know what was going on in my head? We ought to have once a week where we have a senior citizen event or once a month or once a year or something. There's a void. There's a connecting point there. Now, in Julio's mind, it would be so that senior citizens would have an event. In my mind, it'd be so I'd have a place that I could preach the gospel. I'm not saying we're doing that. Brother John said, you know, breakfast, you know what? Men like to do breakfast. Men like to do a get together and grill. This chili cook-off we're doing, there's some guys that are going to get into that. They're, they like to do that sort of thing. And there are people who like to come to that sort of thing. I met some new neighbors yesterday. They were coming down the canal behind my house, and they stopped to talk to me. 
and uh, the young couple, and they've got a baby, and I can't remember their names. They told me three of their names, and I can't remember any of them. Yes, I can. The baby's name is Cruz. Uh, but I don't remember the adult's name. Cruz's parents. Uh, I know what their boat looks like. I'm going to go down my canal. I'm going to find it and invite them to the chili cook-off. You know, we've connected. They've, we've talked twice. We've had st Yesterday they stopped and talked to me about 15 or 20 minutes. And we talked about all kinds of different things. And, and uh, I'm inviting them to the chili cook-off. My neighbor's across the street. Uh, we need to make sure this doesn't make it on the on YouTube, but I want to tell you, they just when they moved in, they just overran our neighborhood. And they just, you know, they put no parking signs on everybody's property around. They didn't want to, they just want to like nobody parks here anymore, you know. And their people had always their area is kind of commercial. They put no parking signs on Dunkin' Donuts property and told the owner of Dunkin' Donuts he couldn't park there, you know. And it just kind of overran the neighborhood at first. And then, man, I'm telling you, the trash, they threw they were coming out for bulk trash and putting it on my lawn, you know, and up in the middle of the night, making racket, and they just really disrupted my universe. Mm -hmm. They're coming to Chili Cook-Off next Saturday, <laughs> as my guests, whole family. I've been going over and helping them with things. You know, I, I go over and... I fixed his pressure washer, the carburetor on it was all messed up and he was going to throw it away and I went and fixed his pressure washer a couple weeks ago and, and I fixed his boat for him and uh, just shown him when bulk trash pickup is and I put their dumpsters away and I talked to their kids and help them fish and let them use my kayaks and you know just want to reach them because they're my neighbors. And uh, that's Julio and Sylvia. You know, he's, uh, you guys have met them. They're sweetest people, aren't they? I had a hard time talking to them at first, but you know, after I mowed his yard for a couple of years while he was out of town, he really liked me a lot. You know, and then when he came home, you know, he's kind of disabled. I go over and do handyman stuff. I'm not, I'm pastor. I'm not a handyman. You know, he needs some stuff done around the house. He's pretty well disabled. So I go over and do stuff for him. Take care of things. You know, there are lots of people that are good neighbors. John's got a good neighbor. Sam was taking care of his taking care of his aunt. John had a great soul winning activity the other day at their house. They had Aunt T's birthday party and invited pa Pastor and Mrs. Price. You know, Aunt T does, she remembers us a little bit now. But she, you know, we're not people that she's thinking, boy, I hope they're here for my birthday. Of course, she's so sweet, she's glad we're there. But why are we there? We're there to meet the neighbors. There to meet the ladies that you know are thinking about maybe visiting our church, but it's just a great place to connect. It's an event for the purpose of connecting. And what I'm saying is, a soul winner is a person that realizes that where you are, the people that you rub shoulders with, are the people whom God has put you in their life to reach, and you just figure out how to do it. John did something really clever. Of course, he's he's a sappy kind of a guy, and this is his sort of thing. But he wrote a nice paragraph about every person there and read it. You know, just made it just a really nice setting. And then the conversations for those things just naturally come up. And we had just a, a marvelous time. And I think his neighbor, Sam, will come to church. I think he would have come for the chili cook-off if he'd been in town, wouldn't he? Yes. Yeah, he would have. And the reason is because of that connection that was made. Everywhere you are as a believer, you're coming across people and you're connecting with them. You say, Pastor, I don't have, I have a hard time connecting with people. Get involved in the church programs. <coughs> Get involved in the bus ministry. Anybody, anybody could go out on <coughs> Saturday morning, walk through a neighborhood with uh, paperwork to sign up kids to go to church, to go to bus ministry. Anybody could do that. If we had people doing it, <coughs> we wouldn't have enough room for all the kids that would come. And if all the kids came, they'd get saved. The gospel's preached in Sunday school. The gospel's preached in junior church. And kids are receptive of it. Anybody here could be part of a program like that. You know, we could do, on Wednesday nights in our church, we could do master clubs. It's like Juana, where we brought in kids. We've got our circle out there for playing games. We could run a kids program every Wednesday night in our church. And we could just reach an unlimited amount of kids. But you know the hard thing about it all is? takes time 
It takes focus and effort <coughs> and faithfulness. And when we serve God, we wear ourselves out doing it, don't we? I mean, it's just, we're just, Pastor, I am so busy. I'm just so busy. I got so much going on. Tell me about it. You'd think being pastor, I'd have nothing but church stuff going on. And all my stuff is loosely connected with church, but it's not preaching. You'd think, you know, all he does is preach. You should follow me a week sometime. See what I, it's just crazy the stuff I do in a week's time. Just visits and talking to people and this person needs this done, I go do that, and this person needs that, whatever, just kind of the guy that does everything for everybody. How do you keep from wearing out or burning out? It's a good question, isn't it? You do what you love and you fall in love with God and do it for Him. Okay, you do what you love, fall in love with God. Yep, that's dead on. Yep, that's right. Okay, balance. Focus on what's important. Focus on what's important. You guys are all you all are right on it. What you do is I see I see it as a sphere. Everything in life whirling around you, going around you. And uh, have you ever been on a merry-go-round that's going round and round? What's a merry-go-round do when it's got one person on the outside or just one person? They whip. It kind of does a whip, doesn't it? Just, you know, um, the Earth is pretty well balanced, but it's got a little wobble to it. The Earth, God set in the universe and spinning, it has just a little wobble to it, and it causes some things like tide effects and and uh, weather changes and all these things. But I just see my life as a, as a sphere, a ball, and I'm just rolling, and everything is surrounds me, I'm kind of at the center of it. But you know what keeps me from being out of balance or out of, or, you know, getting a wobble? Getting in the center of where I'm supposed to be. If you're going to get involved with every activity that's available in the city you live in, you're not going to be able to be involved with every activity in your church. I'm not ranting now, but think of how many how much times have changed with community programs? When do communities schedule events now? Sundays, Sundays, Sundays. Wednesday nights. It's amazing how many people can't come to church because of things that are conflicts with those things. As a believer, I don't have anything that conflicts with church. Everything that I'm involved in Church is at the center of it. It whirls around that. It goes around that. Uh, if I'm going to go on vacation, you know why I've never been on a cruise boat? Here's my confession. You know why I've never gone on a cruise? It's hard to go on a decent cruise that doesn't miss Sunday or Wednesday church. You say, Pastor, you don't think it's okay? You know what? I think God knows my heart. I, if I needed to miss a Wednesday or whatever, I'm not a legalist. I don't think I have to be at every service the rest of my life. I just want to be. I just don't want to go somewhere where I can't go to church. You know when I go on vacation, you know what, what uh, <coughs> affects my schedule? What time I fly? Uh, what days I fly? Uh, where, what city I'll be in at what time? Where I'm going to go to church. In other words, church is kind of what my life centers around. You say, well, you're a pastor. No, it was that way before I was a pastor. i got people that will tell you that. A lot of people that know me know that. In other words, a lot of Christians aren't good soul winners because their career's here, their family's here, their hobbies are over here, mm -hmm. you know, and church is like over there somewhere. And... I've never met an effective soul winner that wasn't effective because of how it worked in God's program. In other words, a good soul winner is a good disciple, and a good disciple disciples disciples. And if that part of your life, if your church is over here, you're not going to get your co-worker to come over here. You're not going to get your friend to come over here. You're not going to get your whatever. You're going to 
have to be right here in the middle. He can come all this way or this way or this way or this way. When you refer to over here, are you saying your physical church? The physical... Well, I'm talking about your time, your life. In other words, if church is a, 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 a sphere of your life or a part of your life, and no, it, I just wanted to it's compartmentalized. It's this part of your life. If you're saying church as in this physical church or a church as in No, I'm talking about your church, your local church. Your local I'm talking church. about the local church. Okay. Uh, yeah, honest, the honest truth of the matter is, is that <clears throat> who you are at work, you're more of a church member than you are whatever you do. I mean, really, I'm a Christian, and being a Christian is you know where I go to church at is over here. In other words, you're more, I'm more of this than anything else. Yeah, I'm a family member, but don't schedule a noon Easter dinner for our family to get together. Because I won't be able to make it because I'll be in church. I don't know how many Christians don't go to church on Easter. It just, it just drives me buggy. I know that church is not the center of their life when on the Sunday of the year that we celebrate the most significant event in a Christian's life, they're not going to be able to come Sunday night. Or they're not going to be able to come Sunday morning because our family all get together on Easter. You're a lousy Christian. You're a sorry, no good example for your family if you'll miss church for an Easter dinner. And it's not because I'm a legalistic. Get, listen to me. It's not because I think, oh, you have to go to church. I'm just telling you, church is a, is a compartmental part of your life and it'll never influence your family. You'll never bring them into that sphere. You're a hobby. <clears throat> if you have a hobby that, well, you know, Wednesday, you know, I come to church on Wednesday nights, but that's the night the group gets together to do this. You'll never get that group to go to church. You never, you just never affect them that way. Um, coworkers, I hate my job. As soon as I can, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm only working this job because I've got debt and I've got to pay it. I'm only working this job because. Listen, you know why you're working your job? You're working your job so that. You can be in your church. Lee's a good example of this. Lee moved to Fort Lauderdale to go to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. You know why he works his job? So he can live in Fort Lauderdale and go to this church. That's it. You like your job? Yeah. Good job? Yeah. yeah. But why, why do you work it? So I can go to this church. Yeah, see, that's, 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 so I can be here. That's what it's for. Uh, you know, it's amazing how many Christians move somewhere because they get a job and then they try to find a church. Hmm. <laughs> That's crazy. That is bonkers insane. If God's plan revolves through the local church, if God's working through the church and that's where you fit and belong, does it not then naturally, logically follow that everything you do is so that you can reach people for the gospel and so that you can bring them into the church. The discipleship thing, it all happens in the church. It happens one-on-one, -on -one, but when you hand them off to Jesus, when you take them to that level where they're a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Him, not your disciple, they're going to be in the church. And so we as believers have got to plug in. We've got to get involved. We have to see things correctly. Who are great soul winners? People like yourselves that understand that everywhere I am is because it's so that I can reach the people that surround me in my life. And even, you know, when I serve in the church, why am I doing it? Well, I'm trying to reach win people. Do you come to church to win souls? You know, it's pretty tough on a lost person. If you came to church and there was a group this size in our service, it's pretty tough on them when I'm preaching not to make eye contact with me a whole lot of times in a really awkward way. Why? Because a good speaker makes eye contact with people, but you can only make eye contact with people that are there. And he really feels like I'm preaching at him if he's the only one here and you're not here. Do you know just sitting in your seat 
And having the Spirit of God in you is an effective part in a church's soul winning program. Just in the, just in the preaching service. It's just really important. Being, just being there. Uh, working in the various programs. You know how many ideas I have for outreaches, but, I, but the reality of it is if we did that, Mrs. Price and Miss Angela would do all the work, and you just can only make them do so many things. I wish we could do vacation Bible school for the whole summer. It would get better every single week. It would get bigger every week. I just don't have the personnel to do it. You know, I, I have ideas, all kinds of things we could do. And I've lost you guys. We're over on time this morning. But I want to conclude, I want us to come to the place where we know what an effective soul winner is and what makes you effective. The most effective soul winners I know are people no one else knows. Because they're not famous for it. And so don't think you have to be famous or well-known. You have to reach the people that are in your sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence revolves around your church. You're right there in the middle of it, and your life revolves around that. And everybody here, okay, I'm here to go to church, and I work a job. Okay, everybody in my job is people I'm going to reach. You know what? We've got, we've got uh, kids, and so we're going to go to the park, and we're going to go to school, we're going to do whatever. And everybody over here is people we're going to reach. How do you define yourself? I'm a dad. I'm a mom. I'm a husband. Well, you identify with people that are those things, don't you? Moms ever, you know, have to at least take your kids to the doctor. You sit in a waiting room, who's there? A bunch of sick little kids. It's like yours. And you, what's that? Snotty nose. Snotty nose, yeah, disgusting little kids. Rubbing their germs all over toys and swapping germs they're all going to bring home. You know? Well, there's people there you can reach. There's other moms there you can reach. You don't go there in the huddle and be like, you know, everybody, I hope nobody talks to me today. You ever been in the, I hope nobody talks to me today? I feel like that a lot of times. I hope nobody talks to me. You know, but, you know, the reality of it is if I'm going to be a soul winner, I hope everybody talks to me. I'm going to talk to them. It just, just flips your mindset. An effective soul winner has an effective soul winner's mindset. And it's just so simple. Community meeting, neighbors, getting together, uh, if I were old, and if I weren't busy, I would live in a 55 and older community and run for the board, run for the condo board. You want to talk to everybody, just become president of your condo association. It's easy to do. A little politicking. You're president of the year, you know, you're the head condo Nazi. And you can just talk to everybody, reach everybody. There's just so many ways. You know, you're a fisherman. You can take, you can get anybody to go fishing, just about. You just take people fishing. Uh, you're a golfer. You can take, hey, can I buy you a round of golf? Just take someone golfing. Somebody likes to do something. I've never done that before. Can can I do that with you? Can you show me how to do that. I. I'm going to tell you something. If we have somebody, if we have somebody I can reach, I'll become a golfer. I'll eat golf balls. If, if, if I have, you know, it's, you know what I'm saying? Effective soul winner just realizes the sphere of influence that he has. He's supposed to reach the people that are surrounding him. And you can reach anybody by just caring about them and being willing to do it. All right, we've gone too long. Anybody have any comments or questions? Somebody should ask there. Are you ever going to end? Tasha, do you have one? No, no, okay. I wasn't thinking that at all. Okay. All right. No, just thinking a while. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is ever going to end. Father, thank you. Thank you for the time we've had. Lord, I pray for our, our outreach this next Saturday, our chili cook-off. And I ask that you give each of us <clears throat> visitors. Lord, if we had as many visitors as we have people in this room, <clears throat> it would be just such an effective event. It would be so wonderful. And I pray that you give each of us visitors for it. And that you would enable us to preach the gospel, <clears throat> to testify of what you've done in our lives. And I pray that this year would be one where Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church reaches people like it never has before. 
because of believers understanding soul winning saturation. And I pray we'd saturate our community with the gospel. Everybody we work with, everybody we live around, and that we would teach others the same things which we've learned so that they could teach others. This method would just explode if it was done your way. So the hang-ups for soul winning, God, not realizing who's called and who's qualified to be a soul winner. Help us to get over that and realize I'm qualified because I'm saved. God, help us to know what a soul winner looks like. Help us to love our neighbors and co uh, co-workers and friends and <coughs> family and people that are interested in the same things we are. And just ask it, that uh, you would help us to just be effective, that, that we would start reaching people that surround us and we'd impact eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.